So, okay, epigenetics. So I appreciate that most of you don't work on epigenetics or are unlikely to do so. So I should just spend a slide telling you what, what, what I mean by epigenetics. So epigenetics is inheritance of phenotype from one generation to the next that doesn't depend on changes in the DNA sequence. So it's not a DNA de sequence dependent memory system. And of course, at one point that would have been very kind of heretical and biologists would all think that memory could, in biology was only propagated through, through you know, the, the DNA sequence. But it's now known that that's not true at all. And there are plenty of examples where you do get this inheritance that's not dependent on DNA sequence. So that's a strong definition of epigenetic memory because it's transgenerational, saying that it's passed from you know, mother to daughter. There's a weaker definition, which is it's not transgenerational, it's just that, the, that there's memory of a cellular phenotype through the cell cycle, from one cell cycle to the next. So you get a, a cell that's in a particular gene expression state, and that gene expression state is then propagated through DNA replication and mitosis into the daughter cells, which will acquire the same gene expression state as the parental cell. So that's also a memory system, and I'll be talking about that type of epigenetics. And, and this sort of memory is also absolutely critical for differentiation and environmental responses, because for, for differentiation, for example, we have all these different cell types in our body which contain essentially the same DNA, yet they acquire extremely different gene expression programs, and therefore they need to have a memory of what the correct program is for that particular cell type, and that is inevitably an, an epigenetic uh, question. Um, and uh, I'll today talk about another system, which is uh, an environmental response system, where uh, actually it's, it's remembering something that's happening around it and its environmental exposure, and I'll tell you a lot more about that. But in reality, these differentiation environmental response systems, they're very, very similar to each other. Okay, so what questions am I interested in addressing? So one of the things that I've been thinking about for a long time is how can you controllably switch epigenetic memory states? So I've told you that you, you, you get cells in particular epigenetic memory states, but of course you don't always want a cell to stay in a particular state forever. You might want to change the memory state in that cell, and that also happens during development, for example. So how do you do that controllably? And that's not a, a, an easy question necessarily, because if you're going to remember something, you want it to be very stable. Yet when you want to make these switches, you want to be able to obviously change the memory state. And that's in somewhat of a conflict with the stability of the memory. So this is not an easy thing for the cell to be able to do. Okay. And the second question I'm going to uh, talk about today, which may appear to be completely separate from this first question, is how do you control, quantitatively control gene expression states? And in particular... I'm going to highlight two types of gene expression states, what I'm going to call an analog state and a digital expression state. And I'll be much more precise in what I mean about that on the next slide. Um, basically, digital being all or nothing, you know, zeros and ones, and analog being a smoothly varying way. It's not just all or nothing, but you can have in intermediate levels of expression. Um, and what I'd like to understand is how you combine these two modes of expression. And what I'd uh, like to... Hopefully, by the end of the talk, what, what I've convinced you is that these two questions are actually related to each other, right? That's how, how, how you integrate these two very different ways of doing quantitative expression and how you flip epigenetic states, that they are sort of two sides of the same coin, at least in the, in the system I'm going to outline. Um, and our approach, as I think Robert hinted at in the introduction, is that, you know, this is going to be integrated theory and experiment, but where we're going to try to construct simple models, but which where those simple models are sufficient to explain some hopefully complex biological phenomena. Um, and this, this is based actually on two manuscripts, uh, one of which is, has been submitted and it is in revision at eLife, uh, and the other one we're, we're just about to submit. Okay, so first of all, I want to tell you just a bit more about this analog versus digital control, because I think it's a very fundamental thing about gene expression, but almost no one talks about it, which has always puzzled me, <laughs> because I, people talk a lot in gene expression about bursty versus non-bursty states, for example, but I think analog versus digital is, an, is a deeper question even than is your gene expression state bursty or not. So, so what do I mean by this? So digital, as I said, it's on, all or nothing, on, off. Analog regulation is a bit like a dimmer switch on a light, right? You just turn your dimmer switch and the light gets brighter and then you dial it back down and it gets dimmer again. And you can select any intermediate level of brightness by just tuning your switch. So how's that relevant to um, quantitative gene expression? So let's imagine that you want to 
quantitatively change the expression of a particular gene. So if you want to do that in an analog way, that's quite straightforward, right? You just dial up or down the amount of expression. And here's a, uh, some uh, representative cartoon cells as you're dialing up your expression. And basically, all the cells behave the same way. And as you increase your expression, you just increase the amount of transcription in each cell. And you get more RNAs in each cell. And at an intermediate level of expression, you just express at an intermediate level in all your cells, right? And I think intuitively, that's what everyone thinks of when they think that you can tune expression up or down, right? That's what you've got in your head, OK? But of course, there's another way of doing it through this digital mechanism, which is quite different, although it creates the same output at a population level. So the other idea is for the digital system is that it's all or nothing in each cell, and each cell either expresses or does not express this gene, but it's the fraction of cells that express it that is being regulated. So as you are in a high expression state, all your cells are making it. In a low expression state, no one's making it, and in the middle, half or two-thirds of your cells are actively expressing. Uh, and then again, at a population level, if you were to do a, you know, just an experiment where you ground up all your cells and measured your level of transcription, you, know, you would see these two things as being the same. Right? You could, you, you're only going to be able to distinguish between these two modes of regulation by looking inside single cells to see how, how they are operating individually. OK. So with that, I hope that's clear, because that's going to be quite important for what I say later on. Um, so now I'm going to introduce you to the experimental system that we're going to use to interrogate these questions. And this is the experimental system I, I've been working on for, the, for a dozen years or more now. And, and the gene is called FLC. So it's in Arabidopsis thaliana. So I'm mostly at a plant research institute. So we're working on this plant gene, FLC. But don't worry, it's not plant-specific, this. Right? The, uh, as I'll tell you about in a moment, the underpinning epigenetic regulation it's completely conserved between Arabidopsis and flies and worms and humans. It's exactly the same. You know, the proteins have different names, but it's the, it's, it's the same system. Um, so, so what does this gene do? Um, so it, it's, it's FLC. That stands for flowering locker C. And it's a gene that aligns plant development to the seasons. Um, so uh, let me just explain to you what, what I mean by that. So as, as doubtless you're all aware, most plants make flowers. Right? And they want to make flowers at a time which is good for reproductive success. Right? So you don't want to make this transition to flowering in the middle of winter because you know, you're not going to be successful at that point. You won't, won't be able to, to, to propagate. Um, so the plant wants to control quite carefully when it makes this very, very important decision to actually make a flower. So there's a whole network which regulates this, uh, the, these dynamics. And in particular, the role of this gene, FLC, is as a repressor of this, of this transition. So if you're expressing this gene to a high level, it represses the switch, which means it, the plant won't flower. Okay? But if you repress this gene, and there's a, a, a pathway in the plant that does that called the autonomous pathway, then you turn off the expression of this gene you relieve this inhibition, and the plant will flower easily. Okay? So it's very important. It's the key node, although there are others. It's the key node that regulates this switch. And in particular, the system that we're going to be talking about in the first half of, of, of my talk is uh, the vernalization system. So vernalization is the very interesting way in which this repressor is impacted by long-term cold. So it's an environmental response here. So if, you, if the plant encounters long-term cold, and I'll tell you what I mean by long-term in, in a few slides, uh, the next slide actually, then this gene, FLC, gets repressed by that environmental output. And then again, once this has been repressed, you'll switch into flowering. And the idea here is that the plant doesn't want to flower until it's experienced cold. Right? So once it's experienced cold, this gene gets downregulated, and then in spring, the flowering can happen once winter has passed. Right? That's the idea. And this whole process is called vernalization. Okay. So here's a kind of cartoon of what FLC expression looks like through the seasons. So it starts out high in autumn, and that's regulated by a bunch of pathways, which I'll tell you a lot more about later on, particularly this autonomous pathway. And then in the winter, the expression of this gene goes down over quite a long period of time, over sort of eight weeks or so. That's how long it takes to vernalize. Um, 
And so there's basically a switching process going on here where, where the expression level goes down. And then what's, what's very interesting is that after the cold, this repression is, is maintained. So, and you can see this has to be an epigenetic process because there's been a transient environmental stimulus, which is this cold, which has repressed this gene. And then when this stimulus has been removed, the repression remains, even though the stimulus has gone. So something's been remembered here, right? You have to ask, well, why doesn't it just go back to the same level of expression it had in the warm at the beginning, right? Because this cold has gone away. But that's not what happens. The, the, the expression levels go down to quite a low level, and then they're maintained at this very low level for, you know, for the rest of the, of the plant's uh, lifetime, actually. So this has to be an epigenetic process because it's remembering something transient. In this case, it's the cold. Okay? Right. So hopefully now I've... Uh, convinced you that this, uh, this process is, is epigenetic, right? Because it's got to remember this. And it's a very important process for the, for, for the plant reproductive cycle. So what happens at, at, a, at a molecular level? You know, what's actually the memory, right? What is it that's actually holding this memory of cold? And it's been known for quite a long time that, that a good candidate for this is actually a, a histone modification. So that's H3K27 trimethylation. So I'll just back up for a moment and just introduce you very briefly to, to chromatin and DNA structure. You know, as most of you probably know, you know DNA isn't just sort of, you know, lying around in the, in the nucleus. It's wound around these nucleosomes, which is the kind of fundamental level of packing of DNA in our cells. So your DNA is wound around a, a, a nucleosome particle, almost two revolutions around this, this nucleosome, and about you know, a couple hundred base pairs of DNA is, is wrapped around these nucleosomes. And the nucleosome itself consists of uh, two copies of four histone proteins. So it's histone H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And there's two copies of each of those that makes up these eight proteins that sit in this nucleosome. So one of these uh, proteins is, is histone H3. And it turns out that these histone proteins have kind of you know, tails that stick out of the, of, of the nucleosome, and these histone tails can be chemically modified. And in particular, in our case, they can be chemically modified by methylation. So, so, so the idea is that you've got a, a, a gene, um, uh, with, and its DNA is wrapped around these nucleosomes, and these nucleosomes have tails that stick out of them that can get these modifications stuck on them. And if this particular modification, H3K27 trimethylation, is stuck on top of the gene, it gets silenced, right? That gene is turned off, okay? So the idea is that what's going on is that during uh, the winter, as this gene, which I just showed you before, is, its expression is going down, what's going on is that the levels of this silencing histone modification that sit on top of this gene are going up, and thereby silencing the gene. And when you measure this, which is what you're seeing uh, down here, so this is measuring this histone modification as a function of time. The, the, the one in black is, is the levels of this histone modification before there's been any cold, and that's quite low. And what you can see that as you give the plants two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks of cold, that the level of this histone modification rises. Right? So the more cold you give it, the more histone modification accumulates on top of this gene and the more this gene gets silenced, this expression goes down. And it's believed that this is the memory element, right? This is what's been, been put by this environmental exposure on top of this gene to silence it, okay? And that's uh, backed up by this experimental data where you can see more cold, more histone modifications. So you can see, at least at the population level, these histone modification levels reflect the amount of cold, right? No cold, low levels, Intermediate cold, intermediate levels, high cold, high levels, okay? So immediately, if I just go back to this analog digital thing that I was talking about a while back, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, there's obviously two possibilities here as to what, how this accumulation could be happening. You know, one possibility is that every gene, every, or every cell uh, in, the, in the Rhabdopsis plant, at its copy of FLC, they're just slowly accumulating these K27 modifications bit by bit during the cold, right? And the more cold you give it at every copy of the gene, the more H3K27 trimethylation I have. But there's, of course, another possibility 
the, 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 the K27 trimethylation and the silencing is an all or nothing thing. And what's going on is it's the fraction of cells that's increasing over time in the cold. So, of course, the question is, you know, which one is it? So I'll come on to the data for that in a moment. Okay. But first, to, 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 to set the scene and to justify the answer to this, why we thought we knew the answer before we measured it, I need to tell you about how these histone modifications are actually added. So these histone modifications are added by something called polycom repressive complex 2. And the way this complex works, is this is a, a cartoon, actually the mammalian version of it, it doesn't make any difference, it's the same. So here's this histone modification I've been telling you about, H3K27 trimethylation. Here's this you know, multi-subunit uh, histone uh, 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 polycom repressive complex. And what it does is that it has a subunit called ED, which can dock to existing K27 trimethylation. And then when that happens, as you can see with this sort of red, <laughs> you know, explosive thing, it, it activates the entire complex. And that means that the whole complex can add more of this modification nearby. So what's going on is that there's the potential for strong positive feedback in the system. But once you have some of this histone modification, you potentiate the addition of more nearby, right? And that means, of course, that the whole thing can kind of take off, right? You put a bit down, it attracts the system, this, this PLC2 complex, that adds more locally, which attracts more of the stuff, and then you build up a high level locally. So there's certainly the potential for strong positive feedback. Yeah, okay. Just yes. Me, so you showed the data before, if you go back from, from slides. Yes. I mean, here it looks like it goes quite quick, so the modification, just the modification. You know, that seven days? Oh, sorry, what, what I should have said. So that T7, what it means is it's assayed seven days after you come back into warm, right? So you give it two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, oh, okay. eight weeks of cold, and then you wait seven days. The, the reason for that, I, I, I've suppressed... So these are seven days or seven days. No, no, sorry. This, yeah. is, this, is, this is no cold, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, plus seven days in the warm. Sure. I, I, I don't have time to show all the data. What actually happens, if I didn't show T7 and I showed T0 right, just after the cold, what you see is that you only get an increase in this region, right? And then when you bring it back into the warm, it spreads over the rest of the locus. But I don't have time to tell you about that dynamics in this talk. It's very interesting, that stuff, it, how, how this nucleates. It's called a nucleation and spreading mechanism, but it's, it's not the, the, what I'm going to talk about today. But that, so well spotted, that, that's why you have this T7 here. Okay. Right. Okay, so I told you about the, the, the feedback. Okay, so that's how you put this complex down. But there's, there's obviously a problem with this type of memory system. And that's what happens at DNA replication. So, you know, I've argued that these histone modifications are memory elements, right? That they're, in, in our particular case, that they're recording the amount of cold that's been, uh, the system's been exposed to. And you can argue, and we'll come back to in a moment, whether, whether they're recording this in an analog or a digital way. But somehow they're, they're recording the, the length of time in the cold. Okay, so then it goes through DNA replication. So what happens in DNA replication? So obviously the DNA gets replicated, but also the parental nucleosomes get distributed to the now two daughter strands. But as you can see, there aren't enough nucleosomes to fully populate both the daughter strands, right? There's only about half the required amount because you've suddenly got twice as much DNA. So what uh, the cell does is, is obviously it incorporates new nucleosomes from the, from the nucleoplasm, but of course these new nucleoplasms will not have whatever, mem whatever memory was sitting on the parental ones. So you can see what's happened is that you've diluted the system. You know, if, there's, if there's memory to be held in these, in these nucleosomes, you've wiped out half of it as, as it goes through DNA replication. So this immediately raises the question, well, how, how can you have memory when every time you go through DNA replication, you're, you're erasing it effectively? You're throwing away half of it. And actually, it, it's, it's a very difficult thing for the cell to recover from because on average, you're throwing away half of it. But it's believed that this process by which the nucleosomes are redistributed to the daughter strands is a completely stochastic process. And that means that a given daughter strand might end up with more than half or it might end up with less than half. It's completely unpredictable how much it will get. And yet somehow, even with this unpredictable inheritance, it would have to reconstruct the parental memory state. Right? That's a really tough ask. You've basically got to know how much you have here, know how many you've inherited fractionally, and multiply by the right amount to get back to what you had before. So it's a phenomenally 
difficult thing for the cell to have to do. So we don't think it does that at all, right? So this is our cartoon of what we think is going on in these epigenetic memory systems, um, which will motivate why we think the memory is, in fact, digital. So what we think is going on is that we have an, an off state and an on state in the transcription of this gene. The off state is turned off by these histone modifications that I've told you about. I've also told you these histone modifications have positive feedback. So once you have them, they make more of themselves. So there's a positive feedback into the off state. Uh, of course, the function of these histone modifications is to repress transcription. So it represses transcription, as you can see here. And what we're going to assume now is that transcription, the act of transcription, tries to push you into, into an on state. So you've basically got a kind of tug of war going on between an off state with these histone modifications with their feedback, which is trying to turn the system off, and a kind of high transcriptional state that's trying to keep it on, and they're fighting it out. And the way we think these systems work is that it's a fundamentally digital, bistable element where either you're off or you're on. And the enormous advantage you get if you make that assumption is that it means you can understand how the inheritance process works. Because if the only states you're trying to remember are <clears throat> essentially no histone modifications, full expression, or full histone modification status and, and no expression at all, then it's easy to recover from losing half or more of your marks, right? So you might start off with like 90% of your histone modifications there. You crash down to 40% say, somewhere around 40 45%. But because it's digital, the feedback can just push it back to 100% or 90%. Because all it has to be able to distinguish between is 100% and zero. Right? Also, if it lost too much and it lost you know, 80%, it wouldn't be able to recover. But as long as it keeps enough of the histone modifications there after DNA replication, it can recover through the feedbacks to push the histone back up to full occupancy and it's able to get around this problem of, of the inheritance of nucleosomes. Okay, so that's a nice theoretical idea. The question is, is this actually true? So uh, some time ago now, we, we actually looked at this in great detail, and what you're seeing here now is a, is a plant root, actually. So uh, with a, a live uh, FLC Venus reporter in it. So what you can see now is, is, is different roots, but they are imaged at live at different after different periods of cold. So you can see after two weeks, there hasn't been much repression. Remember, the cold represses this gene. Two weeks, very little repression, right? You see all the cells have a bright signal of FLC venous in them, like the FLC is still expressed. Ten weeks, it's all gone off, right? There's no expression left. The interesting thing is, well, what happens at six weeks? And what you can see is a, is a very interesting pattern where it seems that some cells have absolutely nothing and other cells have quite a lot of expression still. And it's, you know, quite digital, you would say, right? It's, it's certainly not you've taken the expression in all the cells and dimmed them all down to, like, half the level, right? It's obviously not that, okay? Um, what you can also see is this very interesting structure, right? You know, you might think, well, why don't I see, if it is a digital system, why don't I just see isolated, you know, here's a cell that's off and next to it there's a cell that's on. So to understand that, you, oh, you have to know that the stem cells are actually sitting at the base of the, of the root here. And they're, they're basically the cells that are dividing. And what's going on is that there are some stem cells here which have made this digital switch and some that haven't. And the ones that haven't switched are just pumping out cells in the same expression state because they're inheriting the expression state. And all of those cells in this file all came from one stem cell down here which hadn't made the transition. Whereas right next to it, there's a stem cell that did make the transition and turned itself off, and all of its progeny are now off. And the, the advantage of plant cells is they don't move, right? So they all just line up you know, in, a, in a big file because they've copied the cell as long as you root grows directly down. Um, and and you know, you just, right there, that's epigenetic memory, right? That file, that's, that's inheritance of, of, of expression state. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you now that the, the epigenetic memory state, the memory of cold, is a digital system. Okay? And obviously we've built models to try to understand this. And our more detailed model, actually, we, we don't just consider the trimethylation state, but we consider a series of transitions from a lowly methylated state to a highly methylated state. And we have these feedbacks that we know are there from PRC2, which, which reinforce that silent state. 
We also have the act of transcription, which is, in, which is repressed by these histone modifications. And what we assume from transcription is that it's pushing you in the opposite direction, back towards the expressed state. And we know there's some biochemical evidence that this is true. Um, and this is sort of a digital memory element, right? You tend to end up either in a state that's highly methylated or lowly methylated because of the nature of the feedbacks. And you can just encode, this is not very difficult, a, uh, a stochastic Gillespie algorithm that, that, that you know, encodes the dynamics that I've seen here. And then you can simulate that. And this is the sort of output that you get. So you can see you've got a high methylation level. And this methylation level is inherited through DNA replication. And this huge crash you see is what happens when you do a simulated DNA replication event, when you lose loads and loads of the methylation. But because of the strong positive feedback, it just pushes you back to the expressed state. On the other hand, if you have a, uh, an, a, a complete, an, yeah, at the same time, if you have an unmethylated, so this is the other side of the coin. If you have a high methylated state, you also have very little uh, ME0. That increases at DNA replication as you're incorporating these unmethylated nucleosomes, but that crashes as the feedback replaces this unmethylated uh, substrate with the fully methylated one. Okay. So uh, let's do one aside that is not in a plant system. So um, we recently collaborated with a group at the Institut Curie in, in Paris, which attempted to um, uh, test some of these ideas about whether um, the gene expression was, was, you know, is it really a digital system? But on top of that, is it really the case that, this, that, that it's the act of transcription itself which is antagonizing these silent states? Because remember, what I've got here is that you know, if you transcribe hard, you push the system in the other direction. We think it does that by things like if you transcribe, you're popping out the nucleosomes, you're actively demethylating the histones and things like that. So you're actively pushing it in the other direction. So is, is this really true? So we did some experiments in actually some, uh, 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 some somewhat differentiated mammalian cell lines where what we did was we took these cells and we then inhibited this PRC2, this key factor that was required for the feedbacks. So we inhibited it transiently for 14 days, and then we washed it out. So it's like you have this repressive system, and you remove it for a bit, and then you put it back again. And you ask, well, what happened to the memory? And it turned out there were loads of genes that didn't have any memory, right? They started out being lowly expressed because they were silenced by this system. You then mess up the inhibitor system, and they all come on. But then when you put it back by washing out the inhibitor, the cells just revert to their original expression state. So there's no memory in this system. However, there were a bunch of genes that did show memory. So they started out really not being expressed. They went to being high expression when you knocked out the inhibitors. And when you put the inhibitor back, they stayed at a high level. Now that's memory, right? Because they flipped their state, and then they've remembered that when you put the system back. And what we found about this, and we found actually quite a lot of targets in, in various cell types, and we did it two different ways. What we found is that the ones with, with, um, uh, that, that had this memory property, what, what was special about them is that they were more highly transcribed. So the ones that were able to flip their memory state had higher, significantly higher transcription than the ones that weren't. And that matches this idea but actually it's transcription itself that's antagonizing it. Because if you have a lot of transcription going on, and you start out in this highly, well, you have, have a gene where you could have high transcription, and you start out silenced, and then you mess up the silencing system so that it gets transcribed, and then it's transcribed at a high level, because there's a lot of transcription, and then that high level of transcription is able to resist the silencing system once you put it back. And therefore, it should be only the, the genes that themselves are intrinsically highly transcribed that should be able to have enough antagonism to the silencing to stay in this high expression state. And, th and that's, that was the case. So we validated one of the key assumptions in this model. OK. Right, I'm going to have to speed up a bit because I'm going too slowly. Right, OK. So now I want to go back to this analog versus digital thing that I talked about. So I hope I've convinced you that the memory that after the cold is a digital thing and it's all or nothing, right? Now I want to go back to uh, a, another pathway. So I, I've, I, I've talked so far about this cold pathway, but there's this other pathway called the autonomous pathway, right? Which is also silencing this gene 
but it doesn't need cold to do it. It does it kind of constitutively, like all the time. So, so the question arises, of course, well, here's well, this other repressive pathway. Well, how does that regulate it in terms of this all or nothing thing? Is, is it also like vernalization, a, a, a pathway that works through completely silencing the gene and it's the fraction, or is it an analog thing? So we wanted to understand the answer to that. And we had the tools to do this because we had an, uh, what's called an allelic series. So what that means is that we had some mutations in a gene called FCA, which I'll come back to, and that created an intermediate level of expression. So normally, the, 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 the wild type that we were working had very low levels of expression, and we had another mutation which had very high levels of expression. But that's not very much use in determining whether something's going to be digital or analog, because if something's just really, really lowly expressed, then like, all the cells are going to be off, right? You're not going to see anything, because it's only expressed to a very low level. If we're expressing it to a very high level, well, the chances are that all your cells are going to express it. And again, you're not going to be able to tell between a a digital and analog system, because every single cell will express. What you need is an intermediate level, because then you can tell whether all your cells are expressing at half the level, right, or whether half your cells are expressing at the full level. So we have this very fortunate allelic series that have been sitting there in the literature for about 20 years, actually, so we can use it. So this is the question. Are these FCA3 cells all or nothing or analog? That's the question. So, and the answer is, just to preempt it, is that it's a combination of both in, in a way in which I'll now try to explain to you. So, so the experiments here are that there's two techniques. There's fluorescence imaging, a bit like what I showed you before, where you, where you make a fluorophore attached to the uh, FLC protein, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a bit like green fluorescent protein, most well known. But we have another technique called SMFISH. So SMFISH stands for single molecule fish, fluorescence in situ hybridization. And that's a way of basically lighting up RNA molecules and counting <coughs> RNAs. So it's, it, it's another complementary technique to assess how much transcription you've got. So here's a kind of picture of uh, um, the, the sort of Venus images where we can see actually the individual dots here are RNAs. And I think that's a merge with the, with the fluorescence. Okay, so what happens when we look at RNA levels? And what I'm going to do is compare between these three cases and if you remember, the three cases were all off, all on, and the one in the middle. Okay? So the one that was all on, you see lots of expression by fish. You know, there's lots of RNAs. The one that's all off, you see, unsurprisingly, very little expression. And most cells have almost no RNA in it. The interesting one is the middle one, which is, you can see the mean is somewhat intermediate. It's much closer to the off one, but it's in the middle. Okay? And what you see is there's a bunch of cells that have, if you look at these histograms in more detail, that seem to have as little transcription in them as the cells that are all off, the Landsberg ones over here. But there's some cells that seem to have a, it's hard to tell here, but have a long, it has a longer tail than this one, and that boosts the mean. It's nowhere near as high as, as this FCA1 that's on at a very high level, but, but it seems to support that there's a combination of two. There are some of these cells that are all off, but the ones that are not off are expressing, but to a much lower level than the other case. Okay? So let's see, is that supported by the, the protein data? And actually it is. You get the same behavior. The, the, the on cell, the, the, the on uh, mutant, they're all on at high level. The, the off, uh, uh, the wild type actually, they're all basically off. But again, this FCA3 one is intermediate. You see some cells that are as off as the off wild type, but you see some other cells that are on, but they're much less on than the fully on cells. Okay? So, um, ooh, uh, yes, I will. So, so if you can actually it, look at these in more detail in, actually in the plan. That's just a blow-up of what was in the previous slide. And here I'm just, uh, just showing you the, the, the raw evidence. Here's, here's the, the wild type that's all off, and you just see nothing. Here's the one that's really on, and you see lots of on cells. Here's the intermediate one, and you can't see very much. There's the on one that's slightly on. But when you boost the, the microscope, you can start to see the, the, the protein in these cells, whereas when you boost it in the really off wild type, you still don't see anything. So, so what this supports is that there's a combination of both going on here. That you've, you've got some cells in this intermediate that are really just switched off, apparently digitally, just like I showed you with vernalization. But there's a subpopulation of cells that are still on, but they're much less on than the, than the FCA1 case, where we believe all the cells are fully on. 
So you've got a combination, it seems, of where you've turned a whole bunch of cells digitally off, and the ones that you didn't turn off, you just turn their expression down to a lower level. Okay? So you've got both forms of regulation, it seems, coexisting. But that actually wasn't the end to the story, because okay, this is just showing you that the same thing happens in leaves. That's for plant experts who constantly hassle me with saying that you only ever show roots, and how do you know it's relevant for the rest of the thing? And anyway, don't, don't worry about that one. Okay, so, so the, the, the fact that we had these cells that were fully off made us wonder, right? We know that in the, in the system where we're giving the plant cold, that it's a long process, and these slows slowly digitally switch off over like eight weeks. And now we saw the same thing in this other pathway. We saw some cells were also digitally off. So we wondered, well, could these cells also just be switching off? Not in the cold anymore, but just as a function of time developmentally in, in warm conditions. So we just measured transcription, and we found that that was true. But as time went by, transcription, in actually in all the cases, just seems to be going down like the cells are kind of switching themselves off as time goes by, with the expression levels just decreasing. And then we did a time course of this, and we saw that was indeed true from the fluorescence imaging. We imaged these roots at different time periods, and we could say when we looked at these histograms, what was going on was that the mean levels were going down, and the number of off cells was going up. So as time was going on in this intermediate case, more and more of the cells were switching themselves from this kind of analog dimmed state into the fully silent state over time, okay? So it's quite a complex picture, right? It's a mixture of these two modes, analog and digital, and it seems to be switching from one to the other as a function of time. Um, and here, actually, we did, we were very lucky once or twice that in our live imaging, we actually saw cells that actually were in the process of flipping. So here's, you know, the, this, this one that's marked uh, one here, that's a cell that was, was on at the beginning of the time course, and by the end of the time course, it had turned itself off. Now, they're very rare. We never caught very... We, we weren't able to include this in the paper, actually, because it's too rare, right? And you could always argue, oh, it's just an artifact. But at this point, we, we could capture them very occasionally. Okay, and we built a computational model of this, um, a very simple one, where we showed... where we just had individual copies of this gene digitally turning themselves off over time, um, and, and that could recapitulate almost by construction this slow decrease. What was more interesting is that when you actually made a spatial model of this, you could, you could create you know, patterns in the root that look like real roots, right? which have a particular pattern of, of, of division and replication going on. So it seemed like this idea of a slow switch off into a digitally silent state, but from an analog level, seemed to perhaps be the, the, the correct idea. So here's basically the, the, the kind of punch line, really, which is probably the most important thing to remember. Right? We've got these three cases, the, the, the wild types, something called Landsberg, LER, and we've got these two intermediate cases. And they each start off with a, with a certain level of transcription early on in development. And in the case of FCA1, this is a high level of transcription. And because transcription antagonizes the silencing process, these cells can never silence themselves, and they just stay highly expressed, and nothing really ever happens, or they switch only really slowly. On the other hand, in the Landsberg case, they start off at a very low level of expression, which doesn't offer any antagonism to this digital polycom silencing system, and they just get turned off straight away, very early in development. But then you get this interesting case of the intermediate one, where it has an expression level that's somewhere in the middle. And there, it can hold off the, the, the digital silencing system for a while, but not forever. And so you see this slow switch from an intermediate expression state to a completely off state. And that's what we're seeing over time in this intermediate mutant in FCA3. So you can see it's kind of a, um, a, a you know, it, it supports this transcription antagonism to the silencing. And it supports, going back to the question I asked right at the start of the talk, it tells you that the time scale for this switch is controlled by how hard you transcribe the gene. If you, don't, if you transcribe very, very little, no antagonism, rapid switch. If you transcribe loads, you, your antagonism in current is very, very effective, and it won't switch at all, because it just, it just can never get a foothold, because it keeps on being erased by transcription. If you're in the middle, you'll make an intermediate time scale, because there's some, uh, um, there's some uh, antagonism, but not enough to hold it off forever. Okay. So, 
I've got about another five, six minutes. Right, okay. So I'll, I'll try to now tell you, if you hopefully believe that picture, you know, what's the underlying molecular mechanism that delivers this, right? And this is, I, I, I have to be perfectly honest with you, this is complicated, unfortunately. And, you know, normally when you think of, you know, regulation of, of gene regulation and quantitative transcriptional control, you just think in terms of transcription factors, right? You know, you get a transcription factor and you express it and, it, and, and you turn the gene on and, and it's all quite straightforward. For whatever reason, I, don't, I can't tell you why, this FLC gene has dreamt up a completely different mode of apparently regulating its transcriptional output that's not really determined by transcription factors, but which is in instead determined by chromatin modifiers. And it's, it's, it's a, I, I say, I, I don't know why, but the, let me explain to you how we think it works. We think it works through actually something called antisense transcription, at least in part, where there's an antisense transcript that, work, that transcribes the other way across the gene. That transcript is sometimes terminated and it's processed and in all, in all cells there's a machinery that, that processes RNA and you know, polydenylates them and, and, and you know, something is then done with them and they're degraded off them if it's premature. And what we think is going on is that, is that act of premature termination is recruiting factors that are then changing the local chromatin environment through a factor called FLD which changes another histone modification called K4 mononethylation, which is believed to be an activating mark. So it's complicated, but let me try and rationalize this in a simple model. So we've got another type of histone modification called H3K4, and we think that's only in a monomethylation or no methylation. This particular histone modification, unlike the one I talked about earlier on, the K27 trimethyl, is actually an activating mark. It, it actually promotes transcription. So you've got a kind of module where if you have ME1, you make transcription, and it's known that if you transcribe, you make more of this mark. So again, you've got a feedback loop going on here. Transcribe, but that you put more of this mark down. Okay. On the other hand, if you don't have much of this mark, that tends to work through this alternative antisense uh, pathway that works through proteins called FCA and FLD that pushes you in the other direction, that makes you in a lowly methylated state. And again, you've got these two states fighting it out, but it turns out that because you don't have enough intermediate states, you can't make the system easily bistable anymore. And actually, it's a much more of a kind of graded level of expression, which you can tune by changing either of these two modules. And actually, we, we, we built a mathematical model of this where you could tune this effectiveness of how good these, th this particular repressive pathway was. And it turns out that you can actually then modulate the level of transcription up or down by controlling how well this antisense chromatin pathway is able to mediate repression through this K4 or the absence of K4. So the kind of full picture is that we got really rather complicated, unfortunately, chromatin-mediated mechanism that's regulating this gene. That we've got this sort of analog module that I just explained to you, right, which is, which is controlling in a sort of complex but dimmer switch way how much transcription I have through this modification. And it's hooked up to a digital module, which is controlling whether I transcribe or don't transcribe this gene. And they're hooked up together such that if this first analog module doesn't have enough impact, it means the digital model can flip into this silent state. And it's kind of a temporal ordering. So the, the full model is, is, is quite complicated, but, but the, the, this is the accurate cartoon. And when we simulate it, indeed it works. We can make it so that in the wild type case, these two modules work so that you very rapidly silence, whereas this intermediate case, you can see there's an enormously broad distribution of cell cycles before it will enact the full silencing. And then finally, in uh, this is the last experimental slide, um, you, you can then compare a whole load of data that, that we have with this, with, with the model, including how these histone modifications change as a function of time, and, and another otherwise completely inexplicable piece of data, which says that the repressor for this first analog pathway, although it's definitely a repressor, is only there when the gene is activated. So it's otherwise quite difficult to understand. I'll go through this graph and I'll just explain it conceptually. You know, why do you have a repressor at a gene that's been actively expressed? Well, you'd expect the repressor to be there when you silence the gene, when it can do its repression. But actually the model explains this because 
what you've got is, is this, this analog repression system working through ethyl D, which is constantly trying to silence the gene. And so it's trying in the activated state to turn expression off, but failing. Once it's actually succeeded in reducing the expression, then the system become, you know, flips into this epigenetic memory mode where the polycom gets a foothold and completely silences everything, and then the re this first repressor is no longer needed. So it means you only ever see the repressor when, paradoxically, the gene is actually active because it's trying to silence but failing. And as soon as it succeeds, it disappears because it's no longer needed anymore. So that's kind of the, uh, an interesting phenomenon that was previously completely inexplicable. Uh, I'll skip that one. That's too complicated. So, so here's the summary. Um, so we've seen that this, this autonomous pathway that I've talked about, which is regulating expression not in the cold of this gene, is an analog mechanism. It's involving this K4 methylation. It's an intrinsically dimmer switch, but it's doing it in, in a very elaborate way. And why it's this way, I don't understand. Um, but once it's generated intermediate levels of expression, these levels are actually unstable because it's coupled to this digital system that was constantly trying to push it into a digitally silent state and, and, and when transcription is not high enough, you'll just completely uh, flip into this, this, this digital polycom silent state. So you can see that you've got a slow switch into this digital silent state, and, and, and the time scale is controlled by the amount of transcription. Um, and this is an example, I think, I, I, I don't know of any others, of a gene that starts off being regulated in an analog way, where you can just move it up and down, and it ends up being regulated in a digital way, where you just turn it on or off. And it's the time scale that's, that, that, that's interesting as it goes from one of those pathways into the other. So I think this is quite a, potentially quite an important paradigm for, ha for how in development you make slow developmental switches, which is something you want to do in development. You don't often want things to just you know, happen like that. You know, not everything is you know, a Drosophila embryo where you know, your cell cycle is you know, five minutes. Right? Often you want to make very slow switches. Well, here's a way of doing that. You exploit the fact that transcription antagonizes uh, polycom silencing, and, and, and then you use that to create a slow switch. Okay. Ooh. I think I've gone one slide too many. Right. So just to thank the people who did the work, this is my group. Um, a lot of people contribute to this work. Rare, who now runs her own group in Glasgow. Svenja did a lot of the imaging. That's Svenja there. Govind has made the model that I um, showed you in the second half. That's Govind there. Um, and um, Cecilia worked with, the, with, the, with Raphael Marjoram's group in Paris, and Scott uh, built the original digital memory module, and he now runs his own group at uh, the University of New South Wales. And all of this work, uh, various uh, uh, postdocs from Caroline's group have contributed, but a lot of it's a work, work with Caroline. Also imaging from Stephanie Rosa's group in Sweden, and we had a, a very interesting collaboration with um, Raphael's group in Paris. So, I hope you managed to understand most of what I said, if not everything. And thank you very much for listening. I think it's always an interesting question how you go from, you know, fast time scales yeah. at the cellular level to something which is macroscopic, you know, months or something. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a puzzle because it's, it's, it's easy to make fast transitions. It's very difficult to make slow transitions. That's, that's, I think yeah. that's a, an, an important point, yeah. Yeah, so, are there any questions? Do you have a few minutes, Ruben? So, I, I like a lot this, this transition between digital to, to analog. Uh, one possibility, again, would be that the uh, low expression state that is still analog yeah. is just a not state that is more noisy. Right, okay, you yes. Can see the yeah, yeah. So it, 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 that doesn't seem to be true. Okay, it, it is possible, yeah, that, that, that the intermediate state is just a bit more noisy. But we, we, we really do seem to be able to see cells that are kind of heritable. It, it, it's not, if, 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 it was, if it was just what you said, there ought to be no heritability in these patterns. But we can see heritability in, in the FCA3 case. Because again, you can see files of cells that seem to acquire the same expression state, which if it was just a noisy thing bouncing around, you wouldn't expect to see very much of that, right? You might see a bit of it, because you might, if it's noisy, it might still inherit over, say, one cell cycle, but you wouldn't expect to see it over multiple cell cycles, but, but we seem to. Um, so it really does seem to be, you know, something that's quantitatively different, rather than just being, 
you know, it, it's all analog and, you, and, you, and you've just got it to a, to a very low level. And, and it's supported by the fact that you can see these, the level of these histone modifications change in these different cases over time. It, and, and we know that the histone modifications are a digital system because we proved that in the other case. So again, that hints that there really is a digital switch going on here in addition to it just being an analog thing. But, but it is quite a subtle thing and, and, and it's, it is, in the end, actually I think very difficult to, to, to absolutely prove that what you've said is true, right? That it's just, it's all analog and, and you're just seeing some noise and, and your FCA3 case is just a bit noisier than your FCA1 case, but they're all analog, right? But I, but I think the fact that you see the histone modifications change uh, very strongly argues against that and you see the levels you know, dynamically change over time. Because, um, again, if it was just noisy, you know, why would it change over time, right? It would just constantly be noisy, right, in a, in a continuous fashion. You'd have to have some other way of explaining for why the actual absolute level of silencing was increasing as a function of time. It couldn't just be a noisy system. So it's a very good question, but it's multiple points, pieces of evidence, I think. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So so uh, that's that's a very good question. So in, in Arabidopsis, we're treating it like the whole plant is kind of equal, and you know, each cell in the plant is making an, uh, 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 you know make, basically taking a vote on whether it's had enough cold or not. Um, and it turns out that the downstream gene that this feeds into is called flowering time (FT), and that actually is is itself repressed by FLC. And, um, but it's a mobile protein is the key. So actually, because it's a mobile protein, it's, rep it's, it's basically averaging over the entire expression pattern of the whole plant. So it can, it can get this digital information back out into an analog form to make a decision to flower. But the, the question of whether different parts of the plant communicate with each other, I think is important in other plants that aren't like Arabidopsis, which basically are annuals that you know, die every year. Right, obviously, what happens in plants where you know, it's not an annual, it has to make a flowering decision, but then it doesn't die like Arabidopsis does. And there, of course, you, you, you want to be able to reverse the decision and, and start again. And you might, be on, might want to have different parts of the plant make their own decisions independently of, of, of others. That's also possible. So I think there's lots of interesting questions there that we can't really get at in this experimental system. But, which, but some people certainly look at the vernalization system in per, per, perennials, not annuals, right? And there, there's, a, there's an elaborate reset system where it only remembers it for about one to two months of cold, and then it resets itself. It, it kind of forgets. Can I ask about uh, going the other way? So epigenetic reactivation. Yes, yes. So am I right, the model seems to kind of imply that removal of yeah. wouldn't be enough to get it into that stably activated state that it might need to be paired with instantaneous transcription. Yeah, yeah, so, so it, right, so, so if, if, if all you did was remove the mark, I mean, if you removed all of it, the, the feedbacks would be lost. So I think you'd, you, but, but it would be vulnerable if you weren't transcribing at a high level to perhaps it, you know, it renucleating itself and starting again. So, so you're right that, that, that just removing the modification in and of itself may not be enough to establish a high level of transcription, right? You might need something else to happen. You might, you, you know, you, you, it would probably take time for the high transcriptional state to build itself up. You might need a transcriptional activator to come in there and boost that level of transcription. So it, it's not that these chromatin systems are you know, isolated. They, they're obviously embedded in gene regulatory networks that have transcription factors and, all the, and, and it's all of it together. It's just that this chromatin element is often slightly forgotten about and people just write down, okay, obviously this, this, this developmental network is going to be a GRN of some complex you know, system of transcription factors and that's it. And that's not true. right? If, if you take out the epigenetic element, you're missing a very fundamental part of how these systems operate. And that means you're probably going to be writing down dynamics that's not correct anymore because the memory states are probably held locally in, in, in the chromatin, in these histone modifications, rather than necessarily being you know, attractors of the gene regulatory network. Um, 
right? Now, I'm not saying they can't be an attractor, and in some cases they are, but I think having the chromatin angle gives you a richer palette, right? You, you, you know that there's GRNs, you know that there's chromatin modifications, and you have to actually probably consider both of them in a rather equal way. Um, but you know, reactivating is a, is a complex thing, and, and we think in the part that's done by... It, it, um, it, it expresses a, a demethylase that comes along and wipes it, specifically when it, in the seeds for the next generation. So, so a mechanism is a histone modification that seems to be something relatively new. Yeah? I mean, you certainly work on it plus. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, the, so, so, so the original um, the models have improved. So in the sense that the original models didn't have this transcriptional antagonism they actually assumed that there was a mirror image feedback where if you, are, you, you had not a... Uh, the, 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 the antagonistic state was another histone modification like acetylation or K4 or something which had its own read-write feedbacks that was antagonizing the polycon feedbacks. And I think that, that's not right. But but I guess the question was um, what was uh, um, original uh, from a long time ago, let's say, original ideas how to explain the flowering problem. I mean, I could imagine you yeah. talked about that specific um, thing with the, with the dependence on the cold, but I'm sure there are all kinds of other influences, but, right? I mean, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, there's loads of stuff. There's, there's day length. Yeah, there's, there's, there's like plant yeah. hormones, all oh, sorts of stuff. So also all these things get integrated downstream of FLC in this gene I, I talked about a moment ago called FT. That takes a whole load of inputs. So, and one of the reasons why we don't work on FT is because it's too complicated. So, it's, so we, we didn't. But, but to be honest with you, um, Robert, before we came along, no one thought about it quantitatively okay. at all, right. right? Which was why it was you know, wide open for someone to think of, because it's an intrinsically quantitative problem, right? More cold, more silencing. How do you regulate that? So it was a very natural kind of physical system to think about. Yeah. Yes. You can so you can make simpler models with stronger feedback. It's just that the, these intermediate states exist and they do something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, is there any way to like model it in a way that you still see those? So is, is that about like yeah. Really right. Model? But the, the the thing is that as you simplify it, what you're doing is you're taking out the intermediate states. So what that means is that you tend to compromise the bistability because it's too easy to get from one state to another. The advantage of having the intermediate states is actually it's quite difficult to go from a silent state to an active state because you've got to go through the intermediates and it takes time. And that means you can, you can go backwards and go back to where you started. You can eliminate these intermediate states, but you have to make somewhat unrealistic assumptions about the feedback. and You have to, really, you have to make the feedback basically quadratically strong. To make, and that's not really realistic. I mean, you can argue it's realistic, but only if it's an effective model for there being intermediate states. So, uh, personally, I prefer to keep, keep them in. And actually, K27 dimethylation is measurable and important and also represses. So, you know, but the biologists want us to keep it in. And that's not, that in itself is not a good enough argument. You know, lots of biologists want their protein in your model. We, all know, we know that. But here I think there's, there's, a, there's a good basis for it, you know, from a, from a physics perspective, right, of actually ma maintaining the bistability. Okay, that's a quick one. Is there any evidence about um, mutation that could be involved in Yes. Right. Um, so that's a very interesting question that I don't think there's a definitive answer to at the moment. So in other work that I haven't talked about today, we can see that some of the proteins that are responsible for nucleating these histone modifications do form small clusters. Now we have single molecule imagery data to suggest that they form clusters of perhaps 20 molecules that we think is important in, the, in this process. Um, I, you know, my, my normal answer to, well, is, is it sort of a, you know, a phase separation thing, is I think that's unknown at the moment. No, we, we, we don't know enough about these proteins and about what, what really is the dynamics behind this clustering. Um, you know, it's some kind of condensate behavior. Whether it's kind of a phase separation behavior is, is a separate question, you know, what the kind of physical basis of that is, or whether it's a more kind of classical oligomerization phenomena. I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that. And the whole condensate field at the moment is in a little bit of a mess, I think. 
because no one really knows what the correct underlying basis is. I think people have now convinced themselves that it's not a kind of classical you know, thermodynamic uh, behavior, right, where it's just thermodynamically downhill, which I think was always very unlikely for biology with all the kind of post-translational modifications that we see that, are, that require energy. Um, but exactly what, what those uh, objects are, I think we still don't really understand very well. But there's certainly scope for it to be a, a, a condensate type phenomenon. And, and I think actually the, a paper we published a couple of years ago uh, based on, on slightly separate reasoning suggested that these kind of protein aggregates may also be very important for the memory itself. And it's not just histone modifications. We have some evidence for that. It's quite indirect but when you, when you model some of these systems you, 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 and you compare that to experiments, what you find is the memory is much more stable than you would have predicted based on it only being histone modifications. So my strong suspicion is that some of these protein clusters that we see that may or may not be condensates or phase-separated domains are actually also contributing to the memory as well as the histone modifications. But I can't prove that. It's just a hypothesis at the moment. 